This is the first iPhone to have the drinks mat feature. We're in the middle of a shot here. Let's go. Hey, what are you doing? Hold on to the camera. Ah, 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 we are humanity first. We are the resistance. We will not rust until the separatists are driven from our home. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So we're on part two of our three, maybe four episode series of what would happen if the Separatist Alliance encountered Earth. At the end of last episode, a shadowy organization called Humanity First attacked the UN while Separatist diplomat Wat Tambor was addressing the nation. Several important leaders were killed during the attack, leaving their nations leaderless and in chaos. In this power vacuum, the Separatist Alliance quickly assured the people of Earth that they would find the individuals who are responsible and bring them to justice. After receiving threats against their research outposts across the planet, the Separatists began deploying battle droids to protect their interests on Earth. One month after the UN attack, Unity AgriLabs, a Separatist Earth co-op in San Francisco, was hit by a massive explosion. Casualties numbered in the hundreds. Humanity First once again claimed to be behind the attacks. We warned the Separatists to leave Earth. As long as their battle droids remain on our planet, we will continue to fight against their occupation and all those who collaborate with them. Hours later, Separatist dropships were spotted landing on Earth, and hover tanks and squads of battle droids were seen roaming through the streets of every city that had a Separatist research outpost. CIS units created a buffer zone around each one of their outposts. Civilian traffic was restricted from these areas, many of them located in densely packed urban neighborhoods. This caused civil unrest. Local law enforcement and national militaries across the planet were placed on high alert, trying to create a buffer between the separate destroyed armies and the protesters. Several occupied countries protested against the separatists for their clear transgression against their nation's sovereignty. As a result, the UN Security Council quickly passed Resolution 1138, stating that Confederate forces needed to be withdrawn from the planet. Only security teams pre-approved by their host nation could be allowed to stay on these separatist outposts. Wat Tambor immediately replied. The attack on the UN and our research facilities in San Francisco has clearly shown that Soul 3 is incapable of protecting our interests on the planet. We are most fortunate that we have not treated these attacks as a declaration of war against the separatist alliance. A weekend, massive protests are held in almost every major city. Millions of people are out of work, their daily routines interrupted by the growing buffer zones established by separatist patrols. In Cairo, thousands of protesters attack separatist barricades with rocks and Molotov cocktails. The droids respond by firing upon the crowd with blasters and heavy tanks. Casualties number in the thousands. The situation starts spiraling out of control as violence erupts in many major cities across the world. Tired of their political leaderships in action, militia groups began forming across the planet. Their rallying cry was, Remember Cairo. In the days following the Cairo massacre, the Egyptian government, who usually were the ones who did the massacring, sent a message to the separatist leaders. If their droid army did not withdraw from their positions, they would have no choice but to use force to push out the separatist occupation. Watambo responded by launching a preemptive attack on major Egyptian air bases across the country, 24 hours after the Egyptian government had delivered an ultimatum to the Separatist Alliance, all major combat operations in the region ceased. The Egyptian military formally surrendered. Several Separatist battleships appeared in Earth's orbit and began deploying ground troops to major city centers. Tiny explosions pocketed the night sky as Separatist ships destroyed Earth's communication satellites. The invasion of Sol 3 had officially started. Because Sol 3 lacked a militarized space force, the Separatist Council had outfitted the invasion force with antiquated OOM series battle droids. They had been used more than a decade ago, but were phased out after the invasion of Nabu when an entire force was deactivated once their central command ship was destroyed. Of course, an isolated planet like Earth would have no way of knowing that, and in this scenario, George Lucas only created the original trilogy. There were plenty of deactivated battle droids left in storage, so the Separatist Invasion Force was able to field around 10 million OOM battle droids, roughly 10 times the amount of B-1 droids that were deployed at Geonosis. Supporting them were a few companies of B-2 super battle droids and droidicas. Although Earth's military technology was primitive, the lack of a planetary government on Earth meant that there were hundreds of regional militias. It was estimated that Earth had 50 million active duty warriors. 
not to mention the millions of civilians that would probably take up arms against the Separatists. The CIS would need quantity, not quality, to suppress this planet. Normally, the Separatists would deploy weapons such as a defoliator tank. They were great for destroying all organic life forms while leaving their own droids intact. But Earth's main resources was its fertility, and creating great swaths of lifeless land would be counterproductive. Our military forces had to quickly adapt their equipment and tactics to this new invasion. Several more paranoid military commanders have been keeping tabs on the Separatists since they arrived. But CIS commander droids had also been carefully analyzing Earth's own defensive capabilities. The first attack from the Separatists came not in the form of a ground assault, but with precision orbital bombardment targeting military bases across the planet. Within weeks, humanity's combined air forces were almost completely destroyed. Heavy, large aircraft that needed long runways were all but eliminated. What remained were mostly helicopters and VTOL aircraft. The F-35 program finally paid off. The RAF even refurbished several old Harrier jets, and the Russians did the same with their Yak-38s. The main aircraft of the CIS was the Vulture droid. It flew at a speed of around 1,200 kilometers per hour or 740 miles per hour. But it was their maneuverability that really made them deadly. Because there were no living pilots inside these fighters, they were both light and could handle turns that would rip a normal human apart. But since they only used line-of-sight weapons and did not have countermeasures against missiles, they were vulnerable to human fighters which could attack from dozens of miles away. At dogfighting range, our pilots didn't really stand a chance against a vulture swarm. One of the greatest weaknesses of the vulture droid was that it only carried enough fuel for a 35-minute deployment. That worked fine for defensive patrols around capital ships, but made the droids extremely vulnerable during interception missions. The Americans came up with a strategy where they deployed a few fast movers as bait for the relatively dumb vulture droids. A separate wing of usually VTOL fighters would track the flight time of the vulture droids and calculate their projected return path, and position themselves to intercept their return trip. Most of the time, these vulture droids would be on a straight trajectory and would not deviate because of the lack of fuel, making them extremely easy targets for waiting fighters. The vulture droids were made out of an aluminum alloy and were relatively easy to destroy. But they did have numerical superiority on their side, and as the occupation progressed, they learned to always launch droids during interception missions from at least two different locations, usually a ground-based airfield and from one of their ships in orbit, so they can create a net of droid fighters around their targets. Still, the majority of human aircraft that were lost were due to the initial orbital bombardments or airfields being overrun and the lack of spare parts or maintenance issues. The Russians were the first to completely dissemble their air bases and mobilize all their maintenance facilities. With very few VTOL jets in their arsenal, the Russian Air Force still depended on runways. It was said that a Russian engineer battalion could set up a 500 meter runway and have birds in the air within three hours. They also managed to disassemble many of their aircraft and weapons factories and mobilize them. The Russians had learned well from history. The more territory their enemies took, the more resources they would need to maintain it. The Separatists could grab all the frozen tundra that they wanted. Earth's military commanders quickly learned that high concentrations of troops could be quickly located by orbiting ships and destroyed. The OOM battle droids were terrible as individual fighters and were usually deployed in large parade formations. This was the only time they really posed a threat to humans. Separatist commanders would even stop deploying smaller patrols because guerrilla fighters would just destroy them and steal their weapons. The majority of droids were deployed in defensive positions around massive Separatist agriculture complexes. The CIS battle droid was relatively sturdy compared to their human counterparts and could withstand repeated shots from standard firearms. But higher caliber anti-material weapons and armor-piercing munitions and explosives did a good job taking them down. Their blasters, while powerful, had a limited range and accuracy compared to the slug throwers deployed by humans. Like the Air Force, most countries' ground forces also split up into smaller units to avoid detection. Unfortunately, a lot of these groups were cut off from Central Command, and it wasn't unusual to see a junior officer be the highest ranking individual in a unit. Countries such as Great Britain, which had invested heavily in Special Forces, made life extremely difficult for the Separatists, while nations like the United States had an extremely talented NCO Corps, which meant small unit tactics were extremely effective. Earth's varied terrains and biomes were also causing severe problems for the poorly designed Separatist OOM droids. 
In Finland, military forces withdrew to the mountainous areas of the country. Battle droids had difficulty maneuvering on the steep terrain and were easily picked off by Finnish snipers. In the Arabian Desert, Arab Israeli forces launched lightning strikes on droid columns mired down by sandy terrain. And in the ruined streets of Warsaw, every intersection became a dangerous crossfire zone and every building a sniper's nest. And as far as EMPs at the time, the only militarized way of creating an EMP detonation was through nuclear weapons, and Earth's remaining leaders had saved them as a last resort weapon. We didn't have a compact energy source powerful enough to create the real-world equivalent of a droid popper. For now, Earth was stuck in a stalemate with the Separatist Alliance. The CIS was satisfied with what was happening because agricultural products had begun shipping off-planet. Humanity first had more or less gone underground. No one had heard of them. There have been some attacks attributed to the organization, but most likely they were carried out by copycat groups. Until finally, one day, a message began circulating on radio military frequencies across the world. It was a simple message with a set of coordinates, date, and time in a short message. We found the central droid control station. Destroy it, and we win. HF. And that's all we got time for today, which kind of sucks. Like, there are a lot of backstories I want to tell you guys, but we just don't have the time to include everything in this. But guys, don't forget to hit the subscribe and notification button so you don't miss out on the next episode or episodes in this series. And if you can't wait until the next episode, we've done a few Versus series. They're all different, and we put them in a playlist for your viewing pleasure, so check them out. As usual, guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.